for the young folks or even the folks that are in middle school and high school that want to become college coaches. Can you tell us a little bit about, as literally college football royalty, how you got into coaching and what your path was to becoming a college football coach? That, that really was not going into coaching. I went to Alabama, started off in biology and switched to business. And when I got out, started my graduate program, and I was going, actually going into the business world. And paying for my graduate program, I was a GA at Alabama. Then I went to Arkansas to finish it, and Coach Majors was at Arkansas. That's Johnny Majors, Coach yeah. Johnny Majors, yeah. Another and, famous coach, by the way. And he took the job at Iowa State. And I just walked in his office one day and I said, coach, hire me. And uh, he did. So that's how I got started in coaching. And I had the opportunity to play and coach for Coach Bryant, uh, coach for Coach Burles, and work for Coach Majors for eight years. And during those eight years, he allowed me to do everything from the office to recruiting to what you name it, he allowed me to to do. And my first head job interview, I was more prepared than all the other coaches that they had brought in to interview because he had allowed me to do those jobs. I knew the budgets. I knew the academics, A to Z. And so I really owe everything far as preparing me to be a uh, coach majors. However, a lot of the style that I received from Coach Bryant in playing and coaching. Uh, yeah, so, Coach, you, yeah, so it sounds like you were not planning on becoming a coach. You were going to go into the business world. So what was it that changed your mind? What made you decide, hey, maybe I should try this coaching thing instead of going into the business world? Well, I was mar- a young married uh, person with a young child, and I said, I think I need to make some money. <laughs> very well good well really good answer coach and you uh, a lot of people they work their way up through the high school coaching ranks the assistant coaching ranks but but some people that aren't involved in coaching especially college and pro coaching i think don't realize that the stuff on saturday or sunday is, is just the tip of the iceberg there's a massive amount of work you're basically a ceo of a large organization when you're a college football coach right the day you are yeah, uh, because you, you're dealing with an awful lot of things, not only the players and coaches, but you're dealing with the alumni. And it's just it, you're helping raise money. Tell, it's like any face of an of a organization or a university. Who's the president of Alabama? Yeah. Who's the president of Michigan? Yeah. Who's the president of Texas A&M? If you wasn't an Aggie, you would. I wouldn't know the answer to that question. Yeah, for sure. So the the face of the programs is the head football coach, and that's why it's so important that you have to win. Yeah. And if you're going to be successful and competitive, you have to have a coach uh, that has the ability to do a lot of things. There's a lot of good football coaches. Yeah. But there's very few, and a lot of great assistants, but there's very few great head coaches. Yeah. Well, coach, you started as a head coach at, I, I think, Washington State, where, and you were there for only a year, and then you went to Pittsburgh. Is that right? Yes, I was at Pittsburgh, and I got interviewed in, in Washington State. <clears throat> I called Coach Bryant and I said, Coach, they want me to stay at Pittsburgh instead of, and because they're thinking Coach Majors might leave and go back to Tennessee. Yeah. And he always said the same thing. He said, Oh, Jackie, I ain't telling you what to do or can't tell you what to do. <laughs> but he would tell me a story yeah. of what to do. Yeah. And in that case, he said, when he was at Alabama and he was going to go to Maryland, they wanted him to stay at Alabama for the same reason. 
and he wouldn't talk to his father-in-law, which was a banker, a good businessman. And he said, if they want you now, they'll want you later. <clears throat> so what he was telling me, you need to go get experience because if they want you, they'll want you later. For sure. And so that's why I went to Washington State because of conversation with Coach Bryant. Sure enough, I go to Washington State and then they came after me. And so you went to, you were at Pitt, was it in the late seventies that you first went to Pitt? We were at, at Iowa State and went to Pittsburgh in 73. 73 was the first year. And then I went to Pitt, Washington State, 76, came back in 77, then went to A&M in 1982. Gotcha. And you had, a but like I said, Jimmy Johnson worked for you, Dave Wanstead, you coached Dan Marino, who's a Hall of Fame uh, quarterback now. Was Tony Dorsett at Pitt when you were there? I recruited Tony. You recruited Tony. I, one of the most phenomenal running backs in college football history and yeah, he uh, could football have, history, right? Yes, he could have. He could have been an Olympic sprinter. Yeah, he he was super fast. And the thing I remember about uh, Tony the most is the ninety-nine yard touchdown run, which was the longest in NFL history. And then you also coached Hugh Green, who, if I'm remembering correctly, Hugh Green as a defensive player, finished second in the Heisman Trophy balloting his, I think, his junior or senior year. Is that right? Should have, should have won it. George Rogers, South Carolina, won it. But you know, not taking anything away from George, but yeah. Hugh Green should have won the Heisman Trophy. So how does it – and there's, we always have this debate about can a defensive player legitimately be considered the best player in college football? And you're saying – no question in my mind that yeah. Green should have won it. So what was it about him that made him, in your mind, the best player in college football? He had to – he wasn't big then. He weighed 215. Maybe the heaviest he weighed in college was maybe 218, 220. Yeah. But he had such great quickness yeah. and an explosive quickness. Our first game we played, we're playing Syracuse. They have a – 300 pound tackle and the very first snap he has the 300 pound tackle jacked up with his left hand looking down the line uh, no, he had so much quickness and strength yeah uh, and you know it, it we're playing again Syracuse a year later two years later and he makes three plays in a row he sacks the quarterback chases the quarterback down run the option to the right, and then they come back and he sacks him again. He's, he was all over the field. Great athlete. Yeah, yeah. And so you had some great teams at Pittsburgh. And then, Coach, I, I got to tell you the story from my perspective. I was much younger at the time, but I remember when you got hired at AM, it was – a part of the controversy was you were going to get paid $1.7 million over something like four or five years. And there were people like Dale Hansen, who I still haven't forgiven for this, bitching about the fact that A&M was paying a coach a million dollars a year and they were putting athletics before academics. And now we look back and we see, we see how stupid that sounds, right? But did, it, that was a little bit of a controversy because I think you were the first coach in college football Publicly. To get a million dollar plus contract. Uh, publicly. Pu <laughs> there, were, there were other coaches that were making more than I. Yeah. Uh, Joe Paterno for, was making more than I. Yeah, yeah. But Coach Bryant years ago, and when he came to A&M, there were a lot of games in Houston and games in, in Dallas because he got part of the gate. And really? Wow, and he, interesting. And when, when he went to Alabama, there was an awful lot of games in Birmingham, Alabama. And I would say that his contract, even at Alabama, said that. But Paterno's contract was, was very huge. Uh, I, and I believe, I don't have facts, the story is that he had the – either it was Coke or Pepsi contract yeah. at, Beaver, at Beaver Stadium. 
So all the cold drinks that all the concessions, yeah, yeah, that he had. Now that made him a lot of money too. And the equivalent of that nowadays is coaches that get the uh, shoe contracts and th- things of that nature. But publicly, back at the time, I, is this 1982 when you got hired at Eighty-two. Eighty-two. A uh, publicly, you were the first coach that publicly got a million dollar contract and. Do you remember the controversy around that? People just could not believe that an acad- quote academic institution was paying a football coach that much money. Do they deserve the salary they're making today? When you look at the budgets that they have and the amount of money they're bringing in, you could justify it. But in the academic world, can you justify it? No, yeah. you can't. So let me push back on that a little bit, Coach. I think you actually maybe can justify it, at least in some instances, because like you said, the the football programs at most major institutions essentially fund every other sport at the institution. So without these big football programs, you don't have women's soccer at a lot of these programs. And, 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 and You look at Stanford right now, they cut. 30 sports yeah or 22 sports yeah now you also look right now if we do not have football this fall then there's going to be a lot of personnel and sports at every university cut no doubt about it you're like you said you're already seeing it and i think some people are a little short-sighted about this and they don't recognize it's not just about the football. The football creates other sports programs. It creates all sorts of fi- financial income for the universities that they can use for all different sorts of needs. And hey, you might want to think twice before you start complaining about the football program because you're not thinking about the consequences, the potential consequences to a lot of other things at the school if you don't have a successful football program, Coach. Yeah, you know, I have some great friends that are women basketball coaches. Yeah. And they're scared to death. Yeah. Because if there's not football this fall and we don't get come out of this, then they will lose personnel, meaning on their staff, yeah. and they will, their budgets will be cut. 